Excuse me, everyone. Can I ask you to get a seat? Can you hear me? <laughs> Would everybody please try to take a seat? There's some more room kind of toward the front. If you want some single seats, there's quite a few up here. Happy spring. <laughs> uh, it's great to have such a good turnout here again today. Um, We'll get to our speaker very quickly. I want to let you know quickly the format of what we're doing today, and it's not too different from what we've always done. Our speaker, Susan Applegate Hurst, will speak for approximately an hour and 15 minutes, a little longer than usual. Uh, and then we will break for refreshments and then reconvene in about 15 minutes after. Uh, we'll just break briefly for refreshments. And then um, come back at about 334 questions and answers. Now, if you would, you'll find those pieces of paper on your seats. There may not be enough for everybody, but tear them up and spread them around. Write questions that you have for Susan on that piece of paper, and then after the, at the break, deliver them up here to the podium. That way she can read them aloud, and uh, the questions and the answers then will be recorded for posterity. This whole program is being recorded on cable channel, on the cable library channel, and it will be available on DVD for checkout in the future. So you will go down in posterity. <laughs> I'd like to mention that the library has quite a few books on garden design that are available for checkout. If you want any of these, that'd be great, but take your library card and check it out in the normal fashion in the library. Uh, but come have a look at it. Also on the front table, I put a few of handouts from Susan. One is a book that she's written part of that's soon to be published. One is an advertisement for her business, Applehurst, in, um, in Winterset. And what's the third one? Uh, and one is the class schedule. Oh, class schedule for classes in Winterset. Okay. Um, thanks very much to the City Library for allowing us to have this event here these events here every winter. It's really um, a great break in our routine every winter to think about spring, particularly now. Um, Project Green is the organization that puts on this, um, these events, and Project Green is a nonprofit group, volunteer group in Iowa City that raises funds to purchase beautification plants and maintenance for city property schools, boulevards, etc. Our major fundraiser of the year is coming up in May, and this is a huge plant sale that Project Green has at Carver Hawkeye Arena. All the plants are donated uh, by local gardeners like you and me, and uh, some are dug up in the fall and prepared for spring. Some are, most are dug in the spring, so if you have any plants to to offer, please check the website, projectgreen.org, and um, see if, uh, where you can donate the plants. That'd be great. And that, uh, the plant sale is May 10th? Okay. All right, I will stop talking now, and I, I want to introduce our guest speaker. That is Susan Applegate Hurst. You may remember her from two years ago. We had a really fun presentation from Susan on growing and using culinary herbs. And uh, uh, Susan has been in, in the garden, garden design, garden journalism, garden store business forever. She grew up in uh, Sigourney, Iowa, and she went to school in a number of places, but graduated from the University of Idaho with a degree in business education. She describes herself as a teacher who writes and speaks. And so, uh, with no further ado, let me welcome Susan Applegate Hurst. And thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. And thank you again for inviting me, Mary. And uh, she heard me speak in Cedar Rapids three years ago and said, We have to have you come to Project Green. And um, thanks for Project Green for bringing me back again. I really enjoy coming to Iowa City. And thanks for spending your beautiful, sunny afternoon indoors. <laughs> You didn't expect it to be like this, maybe, but um, this is a huge improvement over a week ago, isn't it? 
As Mary said, I've got some materials up here that you can pick up if you want. Um, one of them is that I contributed an herb garden plan to a book that's about to be out like next week. They'll probably have it at Prairie Lights. It's called Groundbreaking Food Gardens, and I contributed an herb garden plan to that. And then I've got materials um, on my store in Winter Set, so come visit me. A few of you already had. Thank you very much for doing that. I hope you come back again. Okay, um, let's get started. Uh, this is where I work now. This is Applehurst, the inside of my store. My husband and I own the old Madison County Jail in Winterset. And, and yes, we live in it, and no, it's not creepy. <laughs> it's an old building, so it has its old building foibles, but it's not creepy at all. And uh, it's about one-third garden, one-third wine, Iowa wine, and one-third cool stuff. So I hope you come visit. Uh, and this is where I used to work. Um, I was uh, a garden editor at Better Homes and Gardens for two and a half years, I think. Um, I left in 2009, uh, but I also was a garden editor, uh, the editor of Garden Shed Magazine. I was an editor for Country Gardens. Um, uh, where else? I did a couple other things for the website and some other smaller publications. But one of the reasons I'm showing you this also is because I put this pre presentation together, or most of it, while I was still at Meredith, and it uses some of their photography. Thank you very much, Meredith. And I had to give them credit. So that's one of the reasons you're looking at this. Um, and a lot of people enjoy the magazines there because they have awesome pictures. And that's why you get a magazine, right, is to look at the pictures. They're inspiring. They help explain things. They teach lessons. They make complicated things a little easier to see. But um, a magazine, to me, is kind of like the ultimate laptop. Um, as long as there is candlelight, you can still use it. And we hang on to those things for ideas for what we're going to do with our homes and our gardens or anything else in our lives. I, I love magazines. I, I, don't, I let them stack up a little bit, maybe. But um, I love magazines. And at Meredith, they put a lot of time and attention and money into paying for good photography because that's what pays off in the end. And I thought I knew a decent photograph when I saw it when I first started working there, and I quickly learned that I did not know enough. But a good garden photography is not easy to do. Even the best photographers um, don't easily move outdoors. So we use a lot of photographers that really do understand outdoor light and how to use light and how to capture a garden and are willing to roll around on their bellies in the dirt and be up before the sun comes up and shoot until the sun goes down because the best light is in morning and evening. And um, I remember one time I had a landscape architect, a really well-known one, call me upset because we had used a photo of one of his projects on a story about lawn but didn't credit him for the design. But you couldn't really tell it was his. And he said, all the photographer did was show up. I really had to bite my tongue on that one. Um, but, it's, but you know that when you're in your garden and you're enjoying it and um, you take a picture of your garden, the photo doesn't always quite capture that feeling of being in the garden. Or you're trying to show someone how beautiful something turned out in your garden or the blooms on it, and, and they're going, yeah, that's very nice, because it doesn't quite have the... The, the exuberance or the vibrancy or the peacefulness or the elegance that you could see and feel when you were in the garden, right? So it's really, it can be really hard to photograph a garden. Um, and when I first started working there at, at the magazines um, in 2006, I, I, I knew I'd be answering a lot of questions. And there are a lot of chores and planting techniques and plants um, and bug questions, a lot of things that you, questions you answer over and over again, and you try to find new ways to make it fresh and exciting to talk about planting tulips, or a new fresh way to talk about um, uh, putting in a pathway in your garden, or how to plant a tree. Those questions are actually pretty easy to answer. The really hard questions to answer are about design, because you know, you'll, you might see a really pretty uh, backyard landscape or um, a barbecue pit or a mixed shrub border or a perennial bed or an annual container. Sometimes those plans are really inspiring, but then you think, how does this work in my yard? It doesn't quite work with my house style. 
it doesn't fit my climate, it doesn't fit my budget, it doesn't fit my view, but you still want that feeling that you see in the picture. You still want to combine those colors and those plants together. That's, oh, that's the garden I'd love to have. But it can be really difficult to turn that picture on the page into something in your yard. So trying to talk about design in magazines is still a big challenge, it, and, and, it's, and it is on any kind of design. Look at all the, all the magazines there are on, on home, interior home design, on kitchens, on bathrooms, on living rooms, on you know, how to mix different furniture patterns and drapes and carpet, and there's a million ways you can do this, but how do you do it in your house? How do you have the things you want? And I'm not going to approach this in terms of I, how, that I think your garden should look like it belongs in a magazine. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm not trying to tell you what you should do. You already know what you want a lot of the time, but you don't know how to make it happen in your yard. And sometimes when you read articles or books about landscape design, they just, it's just really hard to get going on that graph paper, isn't it? because that's not where you start. You don't start with graph paper. When I, when I was looking for gardens to put in the magazines, and the ultimate test here for me was, can I turn this three-dimensional experience of a garden into a two-dimensional experience on a page and have you be able to relate to it? That's the big challenge. The way we did that is that we would have to go scout gardens. So I scouted hundreds of gardens, visited gardens all over the country. You go, you have someone local help you find some gardens that might work. You take pictures, you look through it. Can I, what does this teach? How can I turn this into a magazine story that people will understand and enjoy? Uh, is it even possible? And then we, we can't be everywhere. So we also had what we called slideshows where field editors would send in dozens and dozens of pictures of different gardens and we have to sit through there and look at that and see if we could see what it was in those scouting shots that would help us decide whether or not we could use that garden in the magazine and make a good story out of it. And you quickly find out that, I mean, it's hard to describe. It's like when you, if someone were to ask you what's good design, it's, it's like, well, you know when you see it, you know. It, it, it's, it's, it's a thing that's hard to describe, and we're going to try to do a little bit of that today, but sometimes it's just, it's your gut reaction, it's how you feel in it. But I think what I really learned from doing all this scouting and trying to turn three-dimensional spaces into two-dimensional experience was that it came down to design. It came down to how that garden was designed because that's what would help me see that I could turn that into something in two dimensions that still spoke to people, that still communicated to people. So I'm, my, my approach to this is not with graph paper and not with a color wheel. I'm so tired of color wheels, aren't you? <laughs> um, but this is, this is about using design principles that you already know and translating that into design style in your yard that works for you. Because what you want ultimately is something that you enjoy looking at and being in. And some of us want our privacy, but many of us also want other people to understand and enjoy that space. And we have to be speaking the same language on that. So there are a lot of things that you know, and we're going to go through that kind of step by step. So like I said, this is, when you think about landscape design, is this what comes to mind? How many of you start designing your garden like that? And, and actually, this is not that it's not useful. It is useful at a certain point. It's useful for, for the installation step. It's useful to help other people understand what you want to create. But that's not where you're starting in your head. That said, there are people that do start this way in their head because that's how they think. But a lot of us are more touchy-feely about it, and, and, we, and we're all very visual, but this is not how you see, most likely this is not how you see your yard. Um, we could add color, and that we're, we're, no, that's still not it. That's, we're not there yet. Um, and maybe a little bit more color, a little more detail on the plant choices, 
but we're still, that's, that's probably not how you think about your yard. It's a little closer to this, where you're seeing a view, and in a perspective view, and the landscape architects do this, all kinds of architects do, there has to be a plan, for, you know, bird's eye straight down to help you space things out, which is an important part of putting your yard together. But you also want to end up with something that you enjoy from your own vantage point when you're standing at the back door or looking out the kitchen window or walking out to the patio with a friend, right? So this is where we're going to go. Remember in high school art class? You all took art class in high school, right? They used to require it. <laughs> no, you didn't all take art class? Well, you probably um, at some point learned some basic art vocabulary about things like, like line and maybe repetition or, or rhythm in design, um, texture. That was always a big deal, texture in art class. Yeah, how do you get textures? Um, and focal point, focal point's a biggie. That, those are parts of what you could say is a visual vocabulary. There are certain things that you see and you know what they mean by how they look, by how they relate in shape or color, um, how they're ordered, how often you see them and what order you see them. And the reason having a visual vocabulary is important is because we all share that to some degree and you want people to understand what you're doing. You want people to understand what's supposed to happen in a place. So we, we use this visual vocabulary to make choices about, about hue, um, about texture in the garden, uh, in terms of surfaces, in terms of plants, in terms of the view beyond. Um, how it relates to the color of our house or uh, the texture of a, of a pathway. All those things come together so people know what to do in that space. When you go, and, and design choices are, they seem to be more important now than they ever have, and there are way more choices than there ever have been before. When you go to Bed Bath & Beyond, have you counted how many different choices you have in coordinated bathroom accessories? <laughs> there's just a, there's a, Gosh, palm trees and stripes and polka dots and bubbles and little animals and flowers and all different colors and some are stylized and some are very realistic and there's, a, but it all relates to function at the same time because you want a shower curtain that's going to hang straight, um, do its job as a shower curtain, but still make you happy when you look at it. Wouldn't you rather have a car that looks great and functions like it's supposed to? Sometimes we don't. Sometimes we like to collect old things and we don't care how they work, but, um, but, it, but for, form and function and design all go together because something has to happen. Um, something, you're going to enjoy a space, you're going to take care of a space, and design affects how much work a space is going to be. Um, in terms of what the walking surface is like, how are you going to mow, not mow, how are you going to prune, not prune, weed, you name it. Just like we do in our houses. One thing I, um, made me, I had to laugh at was um, I was remembering when we used to, and it was a, kind of a fad for a while, remember kitchen carpeting? <laughs> it's gone, isn't it? <laughs> for a very good reason. It was a design choice that was fun, and technology made it possible, but it wasn't so much a good choice because it was really hard to keep clean, and it looked really nasty after a while if you had an active family in it. It was nice and quiet. It was warm, but... So there, and there's a reason that your bathroom floor probably has vinyl or tile, but you put a bath mat that is washable where you step out of the shower or the tub. There's a reason your back porch is probably furnished a certain way. Things get wet. Things get muddy. There's a reason that you do certain things with your yard. You can't just put a patio table and chairs in the middle of the yard and expect to use it a lot because you're always having to move it to mow under it. So you're like, well, I'll put a hardscape there instead. Well, is that hardscape going to be something permanent? Will they have weeds growing out of it? Just all these things combine to make even more difficult choices, it seems like. You kind of know what color you want or what texture. Like I, for example, I'm really envious of the gravel driveways that you see, um, oh, like let's say Southern Illinois and St. Louis southward. 
because they don't have to plow snow. So they have this, this pretty crushed granite, you know, little fine crushed granite driveways. And they're nice and they're kind of smooth looking. We can't get away with that. That won't work here. They can do that because they get ice and snow once in a while, but they aren't plowing all the time like we are, and they don't have cold that sticks around forever. So our big chunky limestone gravel serves its purpose. It might not be beautiful, but it serves a purpose. And in the end, for us, that's what makes sense. Or pavement. Um, so let's talk about, oops, go to the next one. So let's start putting some of these things together. Um, and, I'm, and like I said, I'm not trying to set, set a standard for, for style, because I know probably at least a third of you really don't like that, right? How many people don't like that? Yeah, well, okay, not a third. A bunch of you don't like it, okay? And that's okay. We're not talking about, you know, we're not talking about it in terms of is it good or bad. We're going to take it apart. So what is it that makes this look appealing to you? Well, it probably could be a combination of things. It's probably a combination of color. More likely, the, low, the, the, the small number of colors. Um, and it's, all, it's a lot of pretty green. And it's green that will look good all through the season, which is nice. The boxwood's going to look good all the time. But also notice this, is that, oops, is it working? There we go. Um, this curve. And this structure repeats this curve and this curve and the curves on the urn. So they're gentle curves that keep, they're repeated. They all kind of go with each other. Um, there are definitely some straight lines here. Oh, my battery must be getting low. There we go. The straight lines here, you need some kind of contrast or, or, or structure here. So we've got some straight lines and there's a straight line in the pathway. But it's easy to see, like, if you're standing at this gate, which way are you going to go? Straight ahead. Well, number one, you can't really go where, anywhere else. But this path is telling you where to go. Yeah, OK, use the other pointer. This path is telling you where to go. It's leading your eye and your foot. And it's leading you toward a focal point. If there's one thing I hope you understand today, it's how to use a focal point will remind you that you know how to use a focal point. When you walked in this room, what's the big thing that you see? The screen. How come everybody's facing this way? <laughs> because this is the focal point. That's what's, when you walk in, you see right away, this is what's supposed to happen in here. We all sit this way. We all look at this. Same thing happens in your home. What's, the, what's a common focal point in the living room? Fireplace. The fireplace or the TV. Or it could be a picture window with the sofa in, under it, something like that. But there is a focal point. A focal point is the thing that your eye hits first that kind of organizes the whole scene. It's, what, it's the first thing that gives you an idea of what happens here and where to look and where to go. So one nice thing about having a guard with a focal point is it organizes the view. Because a lot of us have, we go out the back door and we have a big green rectangle, right? Well, there's nothing to draw you anywhere unless there's a focal point. If you don't know where to look or where to go, you might stand around and then go back inside. Because there's, there's nothing that tells you what to do, or, or there's nothing for you to gaze at, there's nothing to rest your eyes on. A focal point, and this, is a, a, this photo shows you an example of a strong focal point, which um, in this garden is probably right here at the urn. That's the thing you look at. And then you might look over to the side, and your eyes come back to the focal point. And you look over to another side or up. Um, you, you, your eye catches this little bit of pink up here. Um, you see how the walk goes around both sides of the urn and the shrubs. But, but basically, you see where to go and what to do. So when you're trying to create a view in your yard or uh, an interesting spot in your yard, think focal point. There can be more than one. But focal point is the thing that, you're organi that, that catches your eye first and draws the eye and the foot toward it. And um, the texture, I wanted to mention that too. We've got a lot of fine textures, but we don't have many different textures. We've kept it kind of simple. So in this picture, we've got the boxwood and the, uh, the Dusty Miller down here and the vines. 
all medium defined. There's nothing, no, no big leaves. Um, they're all kind of fine, not especially rough, but a little, and they kind of have some contrast with the smooth white and the smooth urn. So you need some contrast, right? Contrast is sexy. People like seeing things that are, are um, that vary, in, um, that contrast against each other. They, they not necessarily complement each other, but there's a difference there. So you, you swing back and forth, and it's more interesting than all one texture. Uh, and the scale is important, too. If that urn were you know, a little terracotta pot like the ones we always buy because they're cheaper, we don't want to pay the money for the big ones, you wouldn't see it. But the scale of that urn is um, important to the scale of the structures around it and the scale of the garden around it. Scale's a little harder to, to uh, work with. Sometimes you've got to really try things out to see what works in your yard or next to your house. Remember, your, your yard it, or your garden is connected to your house. You want them to feel like they're part of each other, and scale is an important, uh, important consideration for that. How many people like that? A lot of people like that. And a lot of us, especially if you live in the country or in a suburban area, um, you have a really difficult place that's not very attractive. Um, this is you know, kind of a rough hillside, but they wanted to turn it into something that looked like it was landscaped without having to, I mean, it's, it's a slope. What are you gonna do? You can't put a picnic table on it. Um, you can't really put a structure on it. Um, it's, what it does is it gives you something to look at. It gives you a place to go, and it's fairly, mm, not wild, but it's kind of natural looking, right? And that reminds me, there's, there's one reason, one good reason you don't see a lot of really wild, naturalistic looking gardens in magazines. And it's because they're really hard to photograph. They come across as a lot of fine texture and sprinkled color. They're a wonderful idea, but they're hard to translate in photography until you do the close-ups. So a lot of times if you'll see a prairie garden in a magazine, you see a lot of close-ups of butterflies on flowers because that's the important experience of that garden and because that's the prettiest photograph we can get on some of these looks. Um, you can see how rough this area is. It's mostly, it's unmowed mostly. So all they've really done is trim the boxwood, but these are simple steps. I wonder what's up here. Nothing, there's nothing up there. <laughs> but you wondered, didn't you? You, it draws you up, it draws you in, it makes you, it makes you curious about the space, it makes you feel like something is happening. And so yeah, maybe you get a big fooled you up at the top of the stairs, but um, it's still a nice way to make a, um, a rough spot look interesting and feel like things can happen here. We can stick around, There's not, you're not just looking at a weedy hillside. So they've, they've made it very simple. This is just um, uh, cut timbers. So we've got a little bit of repetition here, a little, bit of, a little bit of texture, the texture in the rock, the texture in the boxwoods that go to the top. But this is all, they just kind of kept out the roughest of the weeds. They keep this, uh, the saplings out. If you've got a, a prairie garden, you know, you're constantly keeping woody plants out of it because that's what will take over in a natural garden. Um, and line also, um, isn't this curving pathway much more interesting than a straight line. If we just did straight steps up there, um, that says one thing, and it, it would look okay, but we like curves. Humans are interested in curvy things. Is that my phone? Darn it. There we go. I'm sorry about that. Now this arrangement could be considered a, a, a focal point in the yard. And look at all the detail in it. So you can look at this a long time. There are lots of things to look at in this. All the different colors, the different textures in the paving down here. I love, this. I love these stones done like that. That's, it takes a lot of time, doesn't it? You ever tried that? You see those stone mosaics that you can put in a pathway? They take a lot of effort. But they're so beautiful when they're done. And the thing is, you wouldn't want to go to that much trouble for something that's far away that you never go visit. The point is to enjoy it in that space close by, right, to keep you there. Um, again, all the different mix of textures. We've got 
things that are smooth, and these rocks are smooth, and the different sedum, and the different shrubs, and the plants, um, the textures play off each other. There's a limited number of colors, but there's, again, that contrast. We've got the contrast with the barberry and all this golden yellow. Remember, contrast is sexy. People like to look at that. Um, in this yard, now you don't see the, the bigger yard overall. This is in like one corner, one side of the yard. So it gives you something to go visit, it gives you something to rest your eyes on while you're sitting at the patio table or um, while you're looking out the window. And the scale of things is all really important because these are all small conifers that relate to these um, perennials and the smaller ground covers. These are dwarf, there's a dwarf conifer, this one too. And why would you want to make sure they were dwarfs? For scale, but also because they are eventually going to, a, a regular tree would eventually outgrow that entire thing and then you got nothing. It would cover it all up. So slow growing smaller trees, you can enjoy this arrangement longer than you would if you put a standard sized tree or shrub in, right? A lot of us forget how fast things are going to grow. It seems like, oh, five years, nah. It'll, it, I, I, it, they, and they put things too close to the house. I, I know that my house in, in West Des Moines had a, um, uh, a bridal wreath, a Van Hoop bridal wreath. You know how big those get. And it was planted like a foot and a half from the foundation. So it was wedged into this corner, and I had to keep giving it a haircut every few years because it, it was just a monster. Um, but we do that with evergreens a lot, and you can't just cut back an evergreen, can you? No, because they don't take to pruning that way. Would you say this garden is more like a peasant skirt or a pinstripe vest? <laughs> now, how do you know that? <laughs> it's because you're using your visual vocabulary. It's because you know what that style generally is. Finer textures, a mix of colors. We've got, all, we've got um, reds, blues, a little bit of yellow in there, white, dark green. So we kind of know that that peasant skirt look is a little casual, lots of fine texture like calico, right? It's definitely not a red carpet gown. But you know that. So see, you already know a lot of this design stuff. It's just how you put it together. And, we'll, and we're going to get to that part. So the colors in this, and, and cottagey gardens often have a mix of colors. Although if you've tried to grow a real cottage looking garden, you know, they say it, 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 those gardens started out with people throwing handfuls of seeds out in the yard. and just It's way harder than that. <laughs> because there's always a lot of stuff growing in there you don't want. Um, these gardens are more are more attractive if they tend to have clumps of things rather than just one, two, you know, little mix, complete, a complete and total mix because that's harder to enjoy. We like seeing the, um, the clumps of, um, of alyssum or forget-me-nots or um, the daylilies. So, and oh, and do you think there's any weeds in this garden? There can be. What's one advantage to this is it's harder to see them but you still have to go pull them because they'll, they'll get away from you. And, um, and the textures are mostly fine and soft, not too many. There's a few here with um, the valerian, oops, shucks. The valerian has smoother leaves, but everything else is kind of fine. Um, there is some repetition. Where do you see repetition? The, the steps are repetitive, and there's also, there's like white, 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 that can draw you through. Repeated colors can draw you through a garden, can keep you moving, keep your eye moving. Because remember, keeping your eye, keeping your eye moving and looking at things, that's what makes it interesting. <coughs> OK, now you can see this one. Um, this was in a garden in Seattle. And a lot of us have this problem that this place had, too where you have a space at the, on the side of the house, at the property line against the house. It's very shady, and nothing wants to grow there, except maybe some hostas and ferns. You might do that. But rather than just leave it saying, oh, nothing will grow here, it's an opportunity. On a hot day, 
that's a very cooling feeling, a cooling place to be. On a hot day, I just want to put my cheek on those stones. It's so it's calm, it's cool. Shade is an opportunity. A lot of us think that shade is like a big problem. Shade is waiting for your attention because you can relax there, especially in Iowa in August. We need cool, shady places. But this is a really simple solution. So rather than having having a um, uh, an area that they're trying to grow grass in that's never going to grow a real lawn, give up on that in the shade. doesn't work. It's been paved, but these are, this is, was simple concrete. Pavers dropped in at an angle, which was more interesting than head on, and then just river stones worked into the concrete. Uh, hostas, we can grow hostas and ferns here pretty easily, but they're um, and arranged in the shade next to the uh, privacy fence, so now it, it looks like something. It actually has a design. It has an appeal to being in that place. It isn't just a space that you pass through from the front yard to the backyard. If you've got a wide enough spot, you can, you can still have room back here for a chair and a little table and enjoy the shade. A lot of us don't do that. We just assume, oh, I can't grow anything here. And you tiptoe through the mud in the spring, and you kind of ignore it. Don't turn it into anything. But it can turn into something really neat. Uh, the repetition comes from what? The, the colors also comes from the stones. This, this, there's another one. Um, people love stepping stones, even grown-ups. You, you know that? that What's that rhyme, step on a crack, break your mom's back, that kind of thing? But people like to step on the stones. People like to walk under things. Just like when we were kids, adults still like that too. It helps create a sense of place, um, a sense of wonder, your, gets your imagination going. And um, life's just way more interesting when you use your imagination the whole time. Line defines mood. Line makes a big difference in how, um, how calm or how exciting a place is. Um, this one, would you say, is it calm or is it exciting? Calm. And why do, what, what about the line do you guess might be, what's the, what kind of line makes it calmer, do you think? Any guesses? The horizontal lines. Horizontal lines are calmer than vertical lines. So tall, straight things are more exciting, more dynamic. They look like they're going up. They draw your eye up to the sky. But horizontal lines are calm. And we see the horizontal lines here. They, and they repeat um, on the roof of the birdcage. And yes, it's a real pigeon in there. Um, and this is a gentle, curving horizontal line like this, like these. Um, there's also the gentle curve of the, of the pot rim. The tulips are nice and straight and upright, so we, they catch our eye. But um, the lines are, uh, lines are calming when they are horizontal, and you need to repeat them. So they're just like a sunset. When you look at a sunset that's not broken up, if it's you know, out by the ocean or whatever, you see that long, that long, straight, horizontal line? That's calm, and that's what we tend to associate with horizontal lines is the horizon, you know, dawn and dusk. Um, Openness that's unobstructed. Uh, there's because and people. There's something in, in the you know in the oldest part of our brains that likes to be able to see everywhere uh, because that way you can see if there's trouble coming or not. But um, it's calming to know that you can see everywhere and that and that horizontal line is, is part of that same response. Color also defines the mood in here because we. Color changes your mood, not just by what colors you use, but by how many colors you use. How many colors do we have? A couple, three, you know, four. We got the pots, we got different shades of gray, we got green, we got white. That's pretty much it. Would you think this is, um, I, well, okay, we can kind of fudge on this, but do you think it's casual or formal? It feels casual in some of the choices, but it's also kind of formal because it's very simple and elegant, very classic choices. The, um, the Luchin's bench, um, we're not going to just keep birds anymore, but um, bird cages, a lot of that, st that kind of thing is, a, is our classic design elements, our classic style choices. Um, so it has a, a more traditional feel, and traditional tends to be a little formal. It's more timeless, I guess. Uh, there's a reason that when you, we just watched the Oscars, right? A lot of us did. 
There's a reason that formal wear is usually solid colors. You don't see very many gowns on the red carpet that are multicolored. Why not? We don't see very, well, you do see a few multicolored bridesmaid dresses, but generally weddings are formal in solid colors, right? So that the big masses of solid color tend to be a little more formal, a little more traditional, and they do change the mood. Remember that peasant skirt garden a while back? Lots of different colors, totally different feel. A little more lively, um, and if we had bigger blot, and we're going to see some bigger blotches of color in a little bit, a little more lively. Um, I mean, circus wagons are lots of colors for a reason, right? They don't paint them black and white or design them like this. They make them lots of big, bright colors because they're exciting, and they want you to be excited. So line defines mood, and color defines mood, too. There's some bright color. Where did your eye go right off the bat? The purple, the delphiniums up here. And you know, there's a reason. Now, also look at this. How are the plants on the left of the path different from the plants on the right of the path? There's a lot of color over on this side, but they're all the same height. Did you notice the fence back here? The fence isn't as important to your eye because the flowers cover it up. The tall plantings are what seem important. The fence is not a particularly attractive fence. So what you're looking at really is the garden because the fence isn't a big deal anymore. Fences serve a purpose. I mean, it's a privacy fence. Um, it looks like it might even be tall enough to keep a few deer out, which would be cool. Um, <laughs> but the reason they've got the tall plantings on the left is to help disguise that fence. If you make the plantings on the left the same as on the right, then that fence becomes a really important piece of the visual of the view. Why would you want it to be important to the view? Why would that, why would that fence need to be important to your view? It doesn't really. So they've made the garden the more important part because that's what they want you to look at. So it covers up the fence. Plus, using that really bold purple back here, and I wish I could grow delphiniums like that, using that really bold purple draws your eye up there. That helps. Uh, you've got all this mix of color, but the purple is the focal point in this view because it drew your eye right to it, but you get to enjoy all the other colors with it. So, yeah, there's a lot going on here. And also notice that the path is not perfectly straight. It does have a curve. Curves, do curves, lots of curves. Um, a lot of, I, I remember I was at a garden in Washington State once, and she had this um, it's a piece of property that went out to um, uh, the Puget Sound. So she basically had the sound in her backyard. Now, how rough would that be? <laughs> but she had this big expanse of lawn, and along both sides, a straight border, 10 feet deep, mind you. They were nice. It was a mix of shrubs and perennials. They were beautiful, but it was straight. It looked like an airplane runway. So, and that's not a bad thing. It's just that it, and she actually asked me, because this was a bone of contention between her and her husband. She said, she took me aside um, and said, so, just asking, if this were your yard, what might you do differently? And I said, well, I'd curve those beds. She said, yes, <laughs> because she couldn't talk her husband into doing that. He didn't like that idea. I mean, they had, it, they, like I said, they were eight feet deep or so. She had lots of room to play with, and it would have been more interesting because it's nice to have something a little hidden on the back side of a curve um, or just to have it, we just like curves. We just like moving lines, and that's what a curve is. It's a moving line. So use some curves. This is in a garden in Chicago. There's a garden designer in Chicago called Craig Bergman. Um, he and his partner used to own, I think it was called Country Landscapes. I don't think they're there anymore. Craig, as a garden designer, he tends to do a lot of really formal upscale stuff. And of course, he has formal upscale clients to go with him. And this is in, um, this is in one of the gardens he designed. That is a fake door. How, what, what purpose does it serve? Focal point, yay, you got it. 
That's right. It's a focal point, and it, and it's a it's it's a focal point because you see it. But it also what what else does that focal point do? What does it make you think of? What does it make you want to do? What does it make you wonder? You what's on the other side? But you can quickly see there's no way to get to that door. There's a little light there right there. There's a landscape light that shines on it at night. But it, yeah, it's a fake door. And they they wanted something in the yard that would look interesting. They had they had young kids and they tried to do their yard in a way that make the kids want to spend more time outside and um, just was interesting and they could afford it. But you know. <laughs> We might not be able to all afford a wall with a fake door like that, but we could still do something way more cool than a plain cedar picket fence, couldn't we? So that's why you see people sometimes put up mirrors in their gardens to give the impression of a window. Um, but, but again, the door is a focal point. It also adds a sense of mystery and wonder. It, it's, it's just, and it's fun to look at. And then the plantings around it, you can see these are not unusual plants, so gardens, Good garden design doesn't have to have like showstopper plants. What works is how they're put together. And these are a lot of simple things um, with the grasses and the heuchera and uh, oak leaf hydrangea and some different climbers. Th those aren't difficult things to grow. It's just how they're put together. And um, again, you can't get to the door from here. And, that, and they didn't want people, you know, they didn't want the kids to be climbing on it or, you know, let's open this thing because it's not going to open. Um, but again, this is another trick, a visual trick, but it also uses your visual vocabulary because right away you kind of, you, you all start thinking things about this. Um, what, what do you think the house might look like in this yard? Probably kind of formal, traditional, maybe it's a castle. You know, that's kind of what they were going for. They had lots of interesting things in this, in this yard because there was a family that had young kids, um, and it was a big, beautiful house. But again, it, it went with the house, it adds a sense of mystery, it creates a focal point, and you can do the same kinds of things in your yard based on what your house is like, what your yard is like, and what other options you have for privacy or, or fence or, or anything. It's just keep in mind that it's just a thing. You can translate that, that thing, that idea, in your own yard. And I'm sure I had something else I wanted to say about that, and I forgot. Sometimes I just get carried away and start yakking. But that's, that's OK. That's what you're paying me for. <laughs> OK. Now we talked about um, visual vocabulary, texture, line, color, scale, repetition. It doesn't matter so much that you remember those words or um, uh, or exactly what they mean. I do hope you remember what focal point means. Um, but how you put all of these things together is how you create style. So everything has colors, but it has different style depending on how the colors are used. Everything has texture. It depends on how you use the texture to create the style. And you all dressed yourselves today. Fortunately, I hope you did. Um, some of us still lay out clothes for others. I know that happens. But um, and I, whenever I think about putting, and I'm not going to show you a color wheel. I told you I wouldn't do that. But I do remember something that my mom said. My mom's here today. When, when we were kids and we put something together that might not go together, whatever that means, you know. I remember one, she used to say, red and yellow, catch a fella. Remember that? Because <laughs> if you wore red and yellow together, you're kind of bright and exciting. And, and men, men do like that. So, um, but, but there's a reason that someone invented granimals, right? Because it made it easier to put color and texture and pattern together. Kids don't always get that. Of course, that's according to what we want them to wear, not necessarily according to what they want to wear. But that was the reason for developing something like granimals. That's why there are coordinated bathroom sets at Bed Bath & Beyond. That's why there are coordinated um, uh, bed linens and curtains, and when you look at a at a, at a catalog, like let's say I look at the J.C. Penney catalog for the um, all the home goods, they put the room together to help you understand those styles. They put the room together to help you not just think about how it would work in your house, but to have it say something. So, for example. Um, 
lately, in the last, oh, say, 10 years or so, that Tuscan Mediterranean style has been really popular, even in home building. Now, why would you want a house with a Tuscan look in Iowa? I'm not saying you shouldn't, but just what is it, that, what is it that's appealing about that? The mood, the colors, the fantasy. It's the story. It's that it's a story that it says that there is a story. Brand new contemporary can tell a story, but sometimes nobody can relate to it because they don't know what it refers to. But when you see Tuscan style in a home, or in a, in a garden, or in clothing, whatever you know what it's referring to. It's referring to probably Italy or someplace in the Mediterranean. It might even tell you what they're going to have for dinner because it, it is creating a story. It can be a fantasy, but it, it creates a story. If you've, if you've traveled in Europe very much, you know there are a lot of really ancient cities in Europe where modern contemporary art is king. They, they love and, it, and it's actually kind of interesting to see. I didn't bring any pictures like that, but if you've been um, to some really old cities, like, like let's say Amsterdam, there'd be really old buildings, and then there'll be this really modern, bright, graphic color structure thing next to it, or canopy over it, or um, there's a lot of that, that contrast between the very modern and the very old, I find interesting. But one of the reasons that that's popular is because if you live in a place that's been there for 600 years, you know that story. You want a new one. We haven't been here that long. We've only been here two or 300 years in our culture in this country. So our buildings and our stories aren't quite that old yet. But look, we're going back to find other old stories from someplace else in Tuscan style, in Tudor style. You know, like in the 70s, that big, heavy Spanish um, mahogany furniture was, was popular. It's not so popular, but again, it was a reach for story. When people decorate in country style, in a brand new home in the city, they're looking for story. So remember that at the beginning, we were looking at the, at the, um, the landscape plans in black and white and the, and the overhead view of you know, the, the landscape design? You don't start there with what your, what your yard to look like. You're starting with what story you want to tell. The story you want to tell about yourself, about where you come from, what you enjoy, what you find important. I think a lot of that, the appeal of that um, Mediterranean style is also about a sense of family and belonging. And I sometimes wonder if it, that even relates to the fact that more and more we are we're peripatetic. Our families are getting sprinkled around the country. We don't see them all as often as we'd like. We move around a lot more than we used to. So what is our story? Because we're no longer so connected to a place as we were two generations ago. It's changed quite a bit. So thinking about the story that you want to tell about yourself, about what you find enjoyable, about how you want to spend your time, that's where you start with your landscape design. You don't start with a blueprint. You start with feeling. You start with, with, um, with gut reaction, with emotion. And you, and you reach that point with story. And you tell the story with style and design. Does that make sense? OK. I'm still not going to show you a color wheel. OK. So what's your design style? How you put together all those elements uh, the, the uh, focal point and color and repetition and line, that's what creates style. So what style is that, do you, would you call it? And there's no right answer, but cottage, cottage, country. And how do you know that? Because of the plant and color choices, because of the home style, because of the lines used. Um, notice curving bed. There's, uh, you can kind of see it, there's a circle, there's a curve in this gate, curve in the arbor, um, curves on the birdhouse. This has got a, a gentle curve on the roof of the pergola. Um, there's curves up here in the gingerbread. So, uh, oh, and then also this circle is repeated on the pickets. And then there's 
curves in the fence. So it all relates. It all comes together. It goes with the house because the house and the garden and the structures all tell kind of the same story. That's a big challenge a lot of people have is their house looks totally different than what they want to create around it. So, and, and that's just always going to, you know, we're always going to have what we have. We try to create the story that we want to create with it. And it, sometimes it can be successful and sometimes less so. But um, again, we call this um, uh, cottage style or country style because of the flower. Uh, this is mostly a mix of perennials and annuals, not lots of big, bold shrubs. Um, nothing is sculpted. There's no shearing going on. That's really popular in, in a lot of traditional styles, but that traditional is a little bit more formal than this, probably. And also keep in mind that anytime you start shearing things or you want stuff to match, they're not going to let you without a lot of work. You know, you plant two identical things on the side of the door, one of them is going to die, isn't it? That's just like it always happens. And if you shear, if you shear shrubs or you try to do, you know, uh, some kind of topiary thing, that's a lot of work. So it might, keep in mind that the story that you want to tell might be that you do a lot of work, or it might be that you hire a lot of work. I, I don't know which. But remember, this is about story. So you can look at this one view of this garden, of this landscape and home, and you can, you can probably imagine a lot about the people who live there. It doesn't matter if you're right or wrong. It's just that you begin to create a story in your head of what happens in this yard or in this home or what kind of people live here, um, whether you like it or not. You don't have to, but you, you're already thinking that. We're all very visual. We try to find reference points. We use our visual vocabulary to make sense of the world. So again, that, and that, that focal point makes sense of a view, but then you look at the details and we start to make sense of the place, what happens there, what, you know, what, what it's like to be in the place, what we're supposed to do when we're there. What style is that? That one's harder to come up with a name for, isn't it? And you know what? It's because a whole lot of us have this ranch style house. Um, I call it Brady Bunch. It's not like the Brady Bunch house. But you know, a lot of the houses from uh, like the late 60s through up about the mid 80s, ranch style was what you saw across the board. And when, I, when my husband and I moved to West Des Moines in 99, we moved into a house that was built in the 70s. And I call it the Brady Bunch house. It didn't look like a Brady Bunch house. But um, for me, it, my struggle was, well, what, does, what yard is going to look best with this house? Because I kind of liked cottage style, but all those straight lines don't really say cottage. All the straight lines in the house and the roof line and the long straight roof line, they don't necessarily say cottage. So w I even went to the Des Moines Public Library and they would have back issues of magazines. Uh, they probably don't do that here anymore, not the physical magazines, you have other ways to look at them. But I checked out stacks of Better Homes and Gardens from, and this is way before I worked there, um, stacks of Better Homes and Gardens from the 70s. And I just went through them, I'm looking for landscapes. Well, they weren't doing a lot with landscaping then. So I would see my house or something like it, and it had a couple shrubs in the front and a lawn, and that was it. Well, and part of that is because, and I still to this day don't know, and I have even asked architects about this, what is the reference point for this style, this, this ranch style? It's a little, bit, um, a little bit Western, a little bit Southern California, but we don't grow any plants or have landscapes like Southern California. We just repeated that, and there's a book that, oh, what is it called? Um, I think it's called Lawn Revolution. And the authors put on one page, they had like four different houses and you could, that you see from the street, house, you know, basic white house on the front lawn. Not old houses necessarily, but they all looked pretty much the same. And they were, one was in Alaska, one was in Florida, one was in Vermont, one was probably in Northern California, and they all looked alike. What, what story were they telling? What were they referring to? Well, a lot of us have houses that they're, that's what they're building, and that's what we get our choices from. Um, and it's expensive to have a custom design created, but that's what people get to choose from. And so that's what happened a lot with, with houses like this. We have neighborhoods of houses like this that don't really refer to a particular story. 
They don't refer to the Mediterranean. They don't really refer to um, uh, the, the, the West or the ranch. I mean, not really. Um, so we're, we try to make our houses tell a story using what we can. And what they did here is you see that they've added um, these wrought iron lattice pillars here. They put white trim on it. They've softened the landscape with a curving walk. They've got all the different colors of flowers. I'd like to see something bigger in here, actually, as it's kind of uh, flat looking. And they did do kind of a rustic looking gate. So they're trying to give it kind of a, a country feel or a cottagey feel. Um, and sometimes it's, that's just, that's what you can do. You, so, you soften the house with color, um, change the paint colors, maybe change the trim. Maybe um, here I think this is added, this peak over the, um, over the front door. They added that to create a more interesting roof line and vary it a little bit. So that's what you do. So they've used line and color and texture to, to tell the story on this house. What style is that house? I don't know, can't see very much of it. Makes me think of the Outback. <laughs> and you know, they, it's, this, is, this is kind of a wild looking yard. Um, it's very, um, uh, to, like I said, it makes me think of the Outback. It's kind of wild looking. But what I wanted to point out is that they have used really simple building materials and a good sense of design to create an interesting gate and entrance here that also suits the house. It's very simple, straight line structure, big porch on it, but these are basically stained two by sixes, just metal strap hangers, concrete block, brick, galvanized metal. This is, this is nothing, there's nothing fancy about it, but rather than just put up a, a plain picket fence, they, do, they did something that looks kind of creative and inventive and still goes with the house. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a rustic style. Um, and they kept the colors simple because if you start doing lots of bright color, then you totally change that really simple roof line and the simple house structure. What I'm trying to get across, I guess, is that you want to use your house style and make it shine and still have the landscape around it be appropriate to it. That, and that can be really hard, um, especially if you just go to Lowe's and Home Depot. They don't have a ton of choices. So like every, every arbor you see at Home Depot or Lowe's, my husband is six foot six. He can't walk under that, <laughs> especially if I plant something on it, because then it's like down to here. So I always had to add legs to them and raise them up so that he could. But then you got to watch how high you go, because then next thing you know, it looks too skinny and too tall, so it needs to be a little bit wider, and then he can still walk under it, and I can still plant on it, and, it, and if it's not like right next to the house, you don't realize that the scales may be a little too big for that back door of the house, that kind of thing. So those things you kind of got to play with, and sometimes you're just wrong. So try it again. Who lives there? I'm, I'm thinking somebody a little artsy. And you know, part of it is that this is a, that they're outside this house, it's, it's very close to the street. It's got the privacy wall pretty close to the street. And when you walk up to it, I mean, it's, you're basically in a small space as you come to the entrance of this home. If you're going to be in a small space looking at something, you better be looking at something interesting. Because you still want it to be welcoming. You still want it to have some personality. Of course, that's a, probably a custom gate that they had created to go there in the wall. But it's really cool looking, and it's modern, and it goes with that house. It wouldn't work with a, quite so well with a farmhouse. It wouldn't work quite so well with a, with, um, with a cottage. It, but it, it, it's a statement, isn't it? And sometimes all you need is one really nice statement piece. And it could have been something off the shelf, but you're, but you're creating a statement, you're conveying an idea, you're starting the storytelling right away. So right away, you have an impression. I mean, I didn't, I didn't hear all the different responses to who lives here, but you all had an idea, right? So you know, it could be someone that's involved in the arts or someone that, um, that is an artist and likes to create new things. They might have made the, made the gate themselves. Um, or they could have picked up at a flea market and just said, this is cool, let's use it. 
so you, ne you never know. But right away, you can tell that the, that the landscape around this house and the house go together and they tell the same story using design, using the lines and the colors. And like I say, there's no right or wrong answer to who lives here. I just, I just, I know that you look at this and right away you start forming ideas. Um, but I want you to again think about what story is created. Again, this is a fence. It, it's a custom fence. It's very nice. It's not expensive materials, but it used regular materials in a good design. And notice how this matches the one on the house. So they go together. So the lintel on the on the on the uh, the arbor on the gate matches the lentil on the house. Um, and they varied, um, they varied the patterns here. They could have just been plain pickets. And that's what most of us have is that, you know, that, picket, that cedar picket fence. Um, and, that, and, and it is what it is. But when you, if you have a chance to do something different in the front, that's where you can really shine. And then also notice that um, these colors are kept kind of simple. They're not too lively, but there are enough color variation to draw us in. And I said I wouldn't show you a color wheel, but this does have a color scheme, doesn't it? They've kept the, the pinks and purples are similar, and a little bit of white to brighten it up, and pretty much anything goes with green. But they've kept it because it's kind of calm. It's it's got it's interesting, but it's not way way lively. Um, it looks like it's probably pretty easy to care for because it's um, annuals or perennials mixed in there. And this is, again, simple materials, but used well, used with thought, um, planned out. The flagstones are nothing expensive, but they're more interesting than a plain concrete sidewalk, right? How many people like this? Just curious. It's different, isn't it? Yeah, it doesn't work for everybody, but, it, but it's, it's a little bit different. And you know what? It's a unique story, because you don't see this all the time. So I, a lot of people want to feel unique, and a lot of us don't want to feel unique. We want to feel like we belong with everybody else. And, and that's okay, because a, a sense of belonging, being part of a tribe is important. That's a human thing. So we want to, sometimes we want to feel like we're a little on the edge of the tribe, and sometimes we want to be like smack in the middle. And, that, and, and we tell that story through what we wear and, um, and through how we uh, decorate our home and what we drive in the whole bit. Like you, the, there, there's a reason a lot of people, even though a lot of people um, around here could afford to drive, let's say, a Rolls Royce, they don't. Um, they'd look dumb. They'd look ostentatious. That's just not how we do things here. Even though they could, a lot of people could afford to do that, they just choose not to. They do make different choices with their money to tell their story differently and still feel like they're part of the tribe. And you all know somebody that um, in your town or in your neighborhood that's just a little bit different because they did something that everybody saw. And, and by the way, it's your yard. They're going to talk about you anyway, so <laughs> do what you want. But the design choices you make are telling your story. And, and, you, and sometimes you'll like something, but you won't get it because it's just a little too much. But you, and you won't do it. And other times, you really want to make a statement. So it's, again, that all those choices are design choices, part of your visual vocabulary. You know what they're saying. That's why you chose them. And this is similar to a lot of traditional style homes that we see now. And again, this is, and this fits in a neighborhood. And there are a lot of, a lot of neighborhoods where you can't do a lot of different things. You know, covenants prevent you from doing really um, very different landscaping because they don't want you to. Uh, I lived in a, a uh, it wasn't a gated community. It was just development on the north side of Houston. And there were lots of rules about what you could or couldn't do. Um, you could not have a satellite dish. And that was back when satellite dishes were the size of a Volkswagen, you know. Um, <laughs> But they kept that rule for the, a very long time. You could not have a clothesline. You could not have a garage sale. You could not leave your, if you were in a trade that used um, an equipment truck, you know, like a glass truck or something, you couldn't park it in the driveway. There's just uh, lots of rules like that. I didn't like that. I remember when I lived there, I, I met a woman who lived um, and this is all a planned community. There were only five builders allowed into it. It was a big community. It was like, you know, 150,000 people. But I remember I met a, a, um, a woman once 
who lived on Woodstock Lane, and she just loved that. She felt different, she said. <laughs> So in this case, the, house, the landscaping goes with the house and it probably fits in a very formal neighborhood. And they've kept it understated because they have different things to say. They have different ways of expressing themselves. So sometimes, like I said, I'm not expecting that your yard has to be something that goes in the magazine. It's just that if you want, if you want to express yourself, I'm trying to give you the tools to do it in a way that works for you and for your home and your neighborhood. Who's that? Oh, look, it must be Mr. McGregor. There's Peter Rabbit right there. <laughs> and I heard someone, I showed this once, someone said they could not stand the hosta flowers. They always cut their hosta flowers off. And I'd never heard anybody that just hated the hosta flowers because they're usually fragrant. But she said they made the yard look messy. And I guess that's the thing with a lot of hosta people. They don't, with collectors, they don't want the flowers. Is that, does anybody else cut their hosta flowers off? See? I knew, that, I knew she wasn't the only one. <laughs> See, I like it, but this is kind of, it's kind of blowsy and flowy and casual looking. But notice how the fence matches the color of the shutters. And, um, and this is, you know, that this is a very romantic, cottagey style. It doesn't suit everybody, but again, right away there's story here. And even if you don't like this, this can still give you the idea, wait a minute, maybe I could have my fence match the color of my house trim or coordinate with the color of my roof or my front door. So you can take it that way. Remember, these are just ideas. There are different ways to put together that design vocabulary. Um, this is all very, the, the texture of this garden is all you know, very soft and it's gonna move in the wind a lot, which is also something people like to experience sometimes. Um, this is a garden that's going to take more care, right? Lots of cleanup in the fall, cut back the spent stems, the spent blooms on the daylilies and the, and the hostas, and, um, and you know, change the grasses, and trim up the vines that go around the windows. So there's, there's some maintenance involved in this. But it's about color and texture and, um, and line. Who lives at that house? <laughs> I do like that big blue door. And see, they've got little blue balls that match this blue circle. And the garden is, now the, the quality of this photograph, I didn't get it, I didn't retouch it before I put it in. So it's very, it's very cold um, and, it, and very blue. But the garden was basically blues and whites. But look at this also. They've got this circle, in the, the circle gate in the fence and a circular bed, so they've repeated the circular shapes, because that's a big, tall, wide fence. So you're breaking it up with some curve a little bit, so it isn't all so blocky looking. And they've they've made um, they painted the trim on the fence. They tried to create design with what's essentially a big, flat fence. Again, I think you probably could see some deer out with that. That would be a good thing. But um, and it's a simple materials, but simple brick, but arranged in a way that's attractive. Um, lots of soft textures, but still, there's a color scheme here. And sometimes, if you live in a townhome, that's all you've got is a space between the garage and the, and the door. You've got a little bit of yard. And a lot of townhomes have rules about what you can have in the garden space, right? You can't always put a ton of things there. But even a small space, even a breezeway, even a little spot, you can turn it into a place that has meaning. You can turn into a spot where you can sit and enjoy it. They've, they've matched the color of the garage door to the chair. The, the flowers are tall, but they add some privacy. They break the wind a little bit. So don't think you have to have an actual yard to do stuff. Containers let you do a lot of things, but if you've got a small space, if you think about it in terms of designing a space, it's a, like a room. It's a little garden room. And we've had magazines called Garden Room. Um, it, you think about what the walls are, where the air moves, where the light um, hits the space, and how you might use it. So you do something with it rather than just having it be a place that you pass through from the kitchen to the garage. So remember that small spaces are, sometimes they're easier to design than big spaces, and sometimes they're harder when they get really small. Okay, let's talk about creating those little focal points and um, 
and decorating spaces. Because you all do this. You do this in your house. Um, you do this with your clothes. You add accessories. You make groupings. You go to, this, you go to um, uh, like TJ Maxx or um, Gordman's or um, Pier One or Ikea, any place, and they put together groupings of things. And sometimes you walk in, you go, okay, I want the whole thing. It's done. It looks good. That's what I need. And, um, and, and stores love it when you do that. That's why they do it. So, so um, think about being disciplined with ornaments and plants because I know, like with plants, when we start getting nice weather and the first time you go to the garden center, you know, kind of know what you're going to get, but you come home with eight more things besides, <laughs> right? Because you, oh, 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 and you have to have that one. And, oh, I can tuck this in over here. And I just want this because I want this, you know. So you, you, you start picking out things. You do the same thing with accessories. So, again, use your design vocabulary so that things can make sense to you and to other people or not. But just remember that they're communicating the whole time whether you say anything or not. Um, so what they did here is they repeated the blue, the blue, the blue, the blue, and, the, and, and see how they kind of, like, move from high to low, vary things in height when you can. Keep, um, if you do a lot of different colored plants, try to keep the number of colors in the containers down to a minimum, or use the same color of container with lots of different colors of plants. <coughs> and they all kind of have the same kind of look. This is sort of cottagey country, right? I don't see any ho ties or Japanese lanterns. Um, I, I don't see. Um, any modern art mixed in with this, and then the art director at the photo shoot threw in that pillow to make sure it all tied together. So, <laughs> and and yeah, we do that. There's usually an art director, or um, if I didn't take an art director along, I had to do it myself or work with a photographer to style the shoot. We call it styling the shoot. And sometimes we add plants, or we you know we turn the pot this way, and we, oops, um, we turn the pot. Um, in a certain way so that it, we can get the whole view in one photo and it looks nice. And you do that. You turn things around so that, they look, that they're facing out, whatever facing out is. You kind of group things like that. Um, another example, there's that country style. You know, the, the, the junk style, the flea market style is so big right now. Um, and uh, there's, in fact, the, the flea market gardens, that issue that came out in, I think it was in January, there are two Iowa gardens in there. Um, uh, I produced one of them. One's in Winterset, and the other one is in Earlham. And then there's a new one that just came out called Flea Market Outdoors, and the other part of that Winterset garden is in that one. Um, but they, the flea market thing is huge, and uh, if you don't like it, that's, that's fine. But I would encourage you, if you do like it, to resist the urge to junkify just because. Because um, you see, and that's one of the reasons why I chose Kathy's garden is because she arranges things. So we've got a gate but, and the grate and the metal gears. The colors are similar, the textures are similar, but she has arranged them. And they have, it isn't just about the junk. It's, it's, it's a design it's layered. It's um, she's she's made a grouping where the pieces all kind of go together, but it isn't just about the junk. She's used that. She's used the the gate and the and the grate. They're basically like lattice. They are a texture. They aren't the design. They are part of the design. So she's added other things that these are like secondary focal points in here. Other things. So she's framed that pot with this grate. And she's, um, this is an artist in Winterset named Pam Dyer Walters. She does long, skinny hearts. She does really, and it's all, almost all outdoor art. It's really nice. Um, and um, so anyway, if you're going to do this, don't get carried away and just start sitting stuff in the yard. Because you know, a lot of us do that because it's cool, but sometimes it just sits there. You don't, you don't want it to be just a stack of stuff. It should convey something. And this is another, remember the, remember the pathway with the hostess? This was also in that garden. So the whole yard kind of coordinated. It was all foliage. The, it was, this was a, there was very little, you know, there's a few flowers like these, like these Rieger begonias, but it was all about chartreuse and dark green and different colors of foliage. It was absolutely gorgeous. But notice how they've got 
all their beautiful different textures of foliage and, and different colors of chartreuse and blue and green, but the pots are understated and they all kind of look similar because this grouping isn't about the pots, is it? It's about the, it's about the wonderful foliage. It's about the colors of the leaves and the textures of the leaves, and that's what stands out. If you, start, if, if you want it to be about the pots, then you keep the plants more similar, and the pots will stand out. Does that make sense? So anyway, keep things, um, try to keep them similar to the rest of the yard in style. Think about how they go together, just like you think about your clothes. You pick, you pick jewelry that goes with your clothes. You pick a coat that goes with um, your shoes sometimes, you know, whatever. You, you, you have different judgment about how you make, how, what style you make, and there is a different style in each one of those groupings, in each of those different gardens. Or maybe you're not so disciplined. <laughs> but you know what? It's all blue. There's discipline there. Everything got painted blue. And look at the flower colors. Primaries. This is a red, blue, and yellow garden. So um, it's fun. It isn't necessarily what I might want in my yard, but it isn't just thrown together. It's, it's, it's wild and crazy. And you know what? I'd love to know that person because I bet they're fun, right? Might be too fun sometimes, but um, so like I said, I'm, there's, I'm not trying to make rules about taste. I'm trying to help you create what you want. And in this case, they've got the, they did they painted everything blue, and that's what makes it all go together. If they were all different colors and the garden were all different colors, where would you look? It wouldn't. It would be even less organ. You wouldn't know what to look. It would just be kind of cacophonous and crazy. Okay. I'm giving you permission. You do not have to have a gazing ball. <laughs> and you do not have to have a, a, a flamingo. You don't have to. If you want to, that's perfectly fine. But that isn't what defines good garden design, is having a gazing ball or having a particular accessory. Is that you don't have to have anything. Um, and the gazing balls are still really popular, not as quite as popular as they were. I know, um, I know a distributor of gazing balls who wishes that they were still popular. He's always trying to sell me some more. Um, but the, and and what it, and what purpose did the gazing ball, ball per, what purpose did the gazing ball serve? Why did what does the gazing ball do? It's a focal point. It could be a focal point. It could be a secondary focal point because it's not very big. You might have a bigger thing that you see, and you put you know something a little smaller over in this corner. So, but it, it's a focal point. Same with the flamingo. And sometimes they're just for whimsy. They're just for fun. They're just something you go, oh, that's you know, it's a little surprise. What's that? Like you, you may have seen the flamingos. Now they aren't all pink. Now they have skeleton flamingos and Christmas flamingos and Easter bunny flamingos. Um, and I haven't seen a red, white, and blue one yet, but I can't imagine why it's taken so long. <laughs> so you don't have to do it just because everybody else is. Think about what you'd like to have in your garden. And if you want to do what everybody else is doing, you, yes, of course you can. But remember, that's what you're communicating. Okay. This garden doesn't have to be just about what everybody else thinks. That's, you, know, you want them to understand it, but it isn't about what other people think. It's about what you want. So i got a few keys for you here in the end. First is to create an invitation, even if it's just for you, because I hope that you spend more time in your yard, in your garden. A lot of us don't. We might create it, and then we don't ever go out there. But you, you, you know, I hope you enjoy it. I hope you go out there, and I hope that you get your friends and family outside so they get off the sofa and away from the television. Sometimes you get to the television outside. I, I get that. But at least you get them outside. So... Um, one thing you want to keep in mind is to show them the door. Where, where, how do you see your house from the street? A lot of us have kind of stopped paying attention to what it looks like from the street. And you know, when you start getting ready to sell a home, that's one thing that realtors look at. You've heard of curb appeal, right? Because it needs to look welcoming. It needs to look like a place people want to go to. And if the shrubs have overgrown and covered up the front door, that doesn't look inviting. If you can't see the sidewalk, from the street. That's not an invitation. Um, this is the house I used to live in in West Des Moines. And it was up a hill from the street. And when you drove up, 
and parked in the street. You couldn't see the side. You could see the driveway. You didn't see how to get to the front door. There was no sidewalk apparent. It was at the top of the driveway, you know, like above eye level. You couldn't see it. So I, um, uh, I got some free limestone and I built steps that angled up almost from street level to the front door and it created an invitation toward the front door. And most of my garden was in my front yard in the beginning because I was the best sun so, and the best drainage. So that, that's lavender. I really miss my lavender. So show them that where, where the door is. Mark the entrance. Uh, mark the entrance to the garden. Mark the entrance to, um, it, like if you're going out the back door, where do you want them to go? Maybe there's a garden gate there because you have a pool or pets or kids that you um, keep a smaller area. Um, but, but mark the entrance or mark it from the street. Where do people go? Why do we think, you think we show the gates open in photographs all the time? It's a signal to you. We want you to feel like, you're, like you can go in. We don't, don't we, in your head, when you look at that page, we want you to feel invited into the garden. That doesn't mean to leave it open in your yard. That might not serve your purpose, but it does show people where to go. So mark the entrance. Gates are the first things people think of, but another th solution is just to put pots on either side of it or plantings, something colorful that just marks where that entrance begins. It's as simple as that. Another way to mark an entrance is with something fancy like an arbor or a trellis. And everybody loves that kind of thing. That's more work. But um, again, people like to walk under arbors and pergolas. They just, they love that. And it, 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 it says, you're here, you know? It does, doesn't it? You want people to feel special. Or it's, I shouldn't, well, I won't tell you who told me this. But anyway, um, when I left my job, at, at Meredith and um, told people where I was going to go and what kind of what I wanted to do and, um, and he said said so you're gonna move someplace we're gonna have people tromping into your house all the time I want to live someplace where I have gun turrets and keep them away <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of us want you know we want it to look like a like a place that's welcoming so that our friends are, are comfortable there so we our family keeps coming back to see us because they like it there they like us and they like the place to visit too so marking an entrance um, is a way to, it's like the first thing people see when they come up. That's part of, that's, a, that's the first, that's the title of your story when they first walk up. Frame of view. A lot of times we enjoy our yard from inside the house. When you get up in the morning, one of the first places you had after the bathroom is the kitchen sink. And we don't have windows over the kitchen sink. This was the window over my kitchen sink in West Des Moines. And I, I loved being able to look out my window. So I, I, I created a view there. And my front windows had the same thing, only because of privacy, I put um, a prairie fire crab kind of in the front of my living room windows. And it was in bloom. It was awesome. So it created some privacy, but it also gave me something to look at beside the house, besides looking at the house across the street, which wasn't a bad thing. But you know what it's like when, you, when people can see in your windows. You like a little bit of privacy. But if you have the curtains closed all the time, it's dark. So you can create some privacy with plantings, but not right next to the windows. Move them back a little bit. So frame of view from inside the house so you enjoy your garden all year round. You can frame a view with a structure. So maybe there's something farther away in your yard. I remember one time in a, in a talk, a woman came up afterwards. She said, you know, I've got an, an acre and a half. How do you landscape an acre and a half? So well, you don't landscape the whole thing, but, but pick out Pick out the places where you want to be able to look that are close enough to work on. Like, you know, what do you see outside the kitchen window? Or when you go out the back door, what do you see or where do you want them to go? What, what experience do you want to have there? Um, and sometimes framing a view is just another way to create a focal point. It, in this case, it draws your eye up to, the, up to the arbor, and then you're drawn further to the garden shed with the path and the garden shed in the, vis in the distance. So you can frame a, frame a view with a structure which could be, like I said, an arbor or, um, uh, or plantings. Here's an example of framing a view with plantings. All this is is a bird bath, but at least there's a design thought out there. There's a path, there's the shrubs. Now, someday those arborvitae will be fat and they'll block the view, so you gotta come down and start over again. But it's, it's very simple, but it, there's a story here. There's, a, there's thought put into this little space. You, your eyes drawn forward. It's framing that bird bath. You might already be looking at a bird bath, but now you can create a view around your bird bath, and the whole thing is appealing even when the birds aren't visiting. So plantings can frame a view. Just don't lose reference when the plantings get too big or overgrown or when one of them dies, whatever. 
sing a song. That, you know, we're not just visual. We often enjoy listening to things. That's why I think water gardens got really, really popular a while back. Um, because they draw wildlife, people like, like ponds and fountains, and then we all figured out how much work a fountain and a pond is. But sometimes a smaller water feature will also help um, disguise street noise, which could be a big deal, um, or just give you a sense of privacy, because even though you, you still might, you know, you're not in the middle of nowhere, but you can get a feeling of that, and sometimes we just really need to feel like we have privacy and quiet, and a little bit of water sounds can help block out the extra noise. Um, listen to songs. Pay attention to what's going on in your garden. Um, water is the, by far the cheapest and easiest way to draw wildlife to your garden. Birds need water, period. They need water year round. If you don't want to get a feeder out, you want to deal with seed mess, you don't want to pay for seed, you put out clean water every day, you will always have birds coming to your yard. And no, you cannot pick and choose which birds. <laughs> it doesn't work. You can't just say, no grackles allowed. It doesn't work quite like that. But they don't use the, the bird bass that much anyway. Um, and plantings that encourage butterflies. If you want to experience butterflies, I mean birds, you've got to have the plants there for it. And you have to use pest, pest, management, situa or pest management solutions that do not destroy the food plants or um, uh, the eggs for next year's butterflies. Offer respite, but I hope you mean it. Because a lot of times we'll put a bench or a swing or a chair out in the yard and it's in the blazing sun. Who wants to sit there? Maybe this time of year you do, but you don't want to sit there in, from the end of June through the mid, middle of September. It's too hot. So, and also, um, you know that chippy white peely painty look on old lawn furniture that's really popular because it tells a story? It also leaves rust on your clothes, or it snags things. So if you're going to put seating out, it can't just be because it's cute. And it, it has to support people safely, and it has to be something you can sit in comfort without worrying about getting a stain on your clothes or tearing something or breaking the furniture. Because some of that old stuff is not meant, it's just meant for looks. It's not meant to sit on. So um, offer respite, but really mean it. And for yourself, too, because you'll be drawn out in your yard more often. I don't know how many times, driving around the country, I've seen these really beautiful gazebos sitting in the yard, maybe 40, 50 feet from the house. I have yet to see a live human body in one. <laughs> People don't use them. Why don't they use them? They're too far away. There's no path in wet weather or in snow. Why, why, else, why, why else wouldn't you sit outside? Bugs. This is screened. Um, it's too hot. There's no, there's no lighting. Um, so you can't be out there at night without, we can't read a book in it. You know, there's just, you, we, we don't, and we, we put it out in the lawn, and there's almost always nothing but lawn around it. There's no plantings. In this case, because there are plantings nearby, the hummingbirds, the butterflies, the bees, we can still sit in the gazebo and enjoy those things because they're drawn close to us. A bird bath sitting nearby, again, you can sit in there and enjoy the wildlife but not get bitten if you've got it screened or if you've got a citronella candle out. But I, I hope that if you, if you um, uh, have the wonderful pleasure to be able to have a piece like this, that you are enjoying it. A lot of people don't. It becomes a very expensive yard ornament. And create opportunities to explore. Um, don't put everything out. Like if, you know, if you've got a big rectangular yard, don't put the garden all around the fence. Break it up with island beds or um, maybe other, you know, other plantings or a trellis, something that creates a, a need to move around in the yard, not just look at it, because I hope you're interested in the patio and looking all around your fence at your plantings. That's very orderly, and there are a lot of people that they, they need to feel that, that sense of control and order. If that's what works for you, that's fine, but you don't have to do it that way. If you want to be drawn into it and you want others to be drawn into your yard, give them a reason to go over it. Give them the path that will guide their eye and foot. Give them a reason, a focal point, something to go take a closer look at. 
And I hope you don't create a monster because, you know, nobody wants to have, if it becomes too much work, and, you, and how many of you have made more garden work than you wish you had? <laughs> I, know, I know how that feels because it's it like, and you start adding more things and adding this and adding that, and you like it, but then next thing you know, you can't go on vacation without it dying because it won't get watered. Or you come back and the weeds are just crazy and they overwhelm you. So don't let yourself get overwhelmed. The kind of work, I mean, either if you can afford conscripts, that's great. But if you can't, don't create something that you have difficulty maintaining because then your story becomes, my garden wiped me out. And that's no fun. I hope that you use your visual vocabulary to create the garden that you want, that other people understand, and that you can share or that you share all by you, just to yourself. I don't care. But I hope this has been helpful, and you can kind of get a better sense now of where to start with your landscape design. Thank you very much.